Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hope you all enjoyed your, your refreshments and glass of wine in front of the fire. I say it was very, very pleasant to use the, the, the great hall in, in the spirit in which it's in intended, which is a uh, uh, discussion, preferably with a glass of wine in front of a nice warm fire. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Sue Hartley, Professor Sue Hartley, as uh, one of our Grand Challenge uh, series uh, lecturers uh, this evening. Um, just a few details about Sue, uh, Sue's background for those um, who don't know or haven't met her before. Uh, Sue is a Professor of Ecology at the University of York and Director of the York Environmental Sustainability Institute. She's a Fellow of the Royal Entomological Society and President of the British Ecological Society. And she's also Academic Lead for the NH Research Partnership Agri-Food Resilience Programme. Uh, Sue's research, which you'll, you'll hear about uh, in part this evening, uh, focuses on using natural plant defences as a sustainable means of uh, crop protection. So it won't surprise you to know that Sue has a really intense um, interest in the wider issue of food security. Um, she has a biochemistry degree from the University of Oxford and a PhD in ecology from the University of York. She joined the University of Sussex in 2001 and then moved to York in 2010 as the director of the York Environment Sustainability Institute. So this uh, innovative research partnership brings together leading researchers from a broad range of disciplines to tackle key global challenges such as climate change, biodiversity, loss and threats to food security. So very much in tune with some of the aspirations that we have at Kiel, particularly uh, our grand challenges based at the Institute for Liberal Arts and Sciences here at Kiel. Uh, she's a member of BBSRC's Strategic Advisory Panel on Agriculture and Food Security. And I remember I was on that panel when uh, BBSRC brought the word agriculture back into, into, into um, in usage, uh, usage again, which was welcomed by um, a lot of us. Um, she's chair of the BBSRC and NERC um, and also ESRC, Sustainable Agricultural Research Innovation Club. And she's also recently appointed to the Board of Trustees of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew for the next three years by the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, Minister Lord Gardiner. In 2009, many of you would have seen her on television where she delivered the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, becoming only the fourth woman to do so since they began in 1825. Um, fortunately, we've already broken that record with women speaking at uh, our institute, but uh, good to see that you've, you were breaking, uh, breaking, breaking ground uh, there. Uh, Sue and I got to know each other uh, through the N8 uh, development of the N8 uh, uh, partnership in food security um, a few years ago um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the northwest. Uh, it was a very exciting time. I think we were reflecting earlier what a different world it was. It seemed a very sort of stable economic world. It seemed a very relatively stable political world, actually. And um, uh, things have very different, I think, since then. So maybe a few re reflections on, on that in, in your lecture. I think the, the other thing that you would appreciate from her CV, the panels that she sits on and the uh, individuals that she, um, that she uh, interacts with, uh, just how interdisciplinary that world is. And when you're thinking about the wider issues of food security, just how absolutely essential it is to think uh, right from the basic science all the way through to the social and the policy issues, and that's something very close to, 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 uh, to Sue's research. Um, she's going to um, talk this evening on, on a title which um, I think is absolutely fascinating, um, um, Plant Wars, or you have spoken in the past on pl Plant yeah, Wars. You're not going to sp speak... That was my, uh, that was my uh, Christmas lectures. That was your Christmas lectures, that's yeah. right, yes. Um, and... Um, so, uh, again, um, including chilli tasting, uh, the animals strike back, talking to trees, and dangerous and delicious. And um, Sue is, is a real, in, in the best possible sense of the world, tree hugger. I know that she uses it rather pejoratively sometimes, but she's been hugging trees, um, quite literally, um, on, on television. Um, and I'm uh, fascinated by the um, programme you made about the life of the oak tree, I think it was. Um, where I think you were hugging trees, but also some, some amazing time-lapse photography that the, 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 the crew had put together around that. 
So I look forward to um, hearing uh, Sue's talk this evening. As usual, there'll be a chance for uh, open discussion and questions at the end. And we'll take this chance also to thank members of the audience and those, and Sue in particular, for participating in a discussion we had earlier this afternoon that prompted some really lively, interesting um, uh, discussion and we'll have a chance for some more questions at the end today. So without further ado, I introduce Professor Sue Hartley to give our Grand Challenge series lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for that very kind uh, introduction. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, at Kiel. It's always uh, interesting and exciting to talk to people about the value of interdisciplinary research. And I'm really pleased to see that that's so high on the agenda here at, at Kiel. And uh, I've also uh, to confess to a, to, a, to a family connection, actually. My, my father was, was here as an undergraduate. And uh, we were just trying to work it out before, before I stood up, but probably in the early 50s, uh, which actually tells you something about how long in the tooth I'm getting. But uh, uh, I imagine uh, I can report back to him that, uh, that Kiel is, uh, is still very much a thriving place. And, uh, uh, and if it's anything like York, you have a lot more campus buildings than you had back then. So... The title of this lecture series is uh, Grand Challenges, and, and I want to talk about one of the biggest challenges that we, that we face at the moment, and that is producing uh, sufficient, uh, healthy and nutritious food for a growing population, but in a sustainable way, without doing more environmental damage and without increasing our inputs of, of scarce uh, and expensive resources like fertiliser and pesticides. And we've got to do all that uh, against a backdrop of uh, uh, climate change, which is already starting to show uh, impacts on, on, on food production. But it's not all gloom and doom. We do have challenges, but I hope I can show you that we also have solutions. But I'm going to start off with uh, a little bit of, a, of a, a, a look at the challenge that we face. And uh, there are some quite frightening uh, statistics out there, or maybe I should call them alternative facts. Um, we will need to produce more food in, in the next uh, 40 years than in the previous 10,000 combined. And we have to do that, as I've said, against a background of increasingly unpredictable climate. And we can't just simply grow our way out of trouble because agriculture already uses a lot of the world's resources. It uses uh, about 70% of the world's fresh water, over a third of the land area, and is also responsible for, for some, some damaging environmental impacts. So deforestation and greenhouse gases. So we can't simply just ratchet up uh, agriculture. We have to be more innovative. And climate change is already starting to impact on, on yields, but it has another uh, issue in that in some of the most vulnerable parts of the world, it, it could actually reduce the area for food production at a time uh, when we need to be increasing yields. So even just by those, that very brief introduction, I hope you can see that um, the challenge here is very much an interdisciplinary and interconnected one. So this is uh, Ban Ki-moon, the, the former uh, UN Secretary General. We need to connect the dots between climate, poverty, energy, food and water. These issues cannot be addressed in isolation. And uh, one of my other roles... That, uh, that I've just taken on is to be uh, a, a co-I on a centre called the uh, Centre for Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus, which probably means almost nothing to you. It didn't mean a great deal to me, actually. But the nexus being food, energy, water and environment. And how can... The aim of the centre is to try and understand how we can develop policies that kind of uh, enable us to navigate through this complex intersection of environmental issues. And one way we can do that is by bringing together expertise from different disciplines. I think that's absolutely essential to tackle these big uh, global problems. We can't do that just in our little disciplinary silos. And um, 
As Jonathan said, one of the reasons that I, I moved to York was to become the founding director of the York Environmental Sustainability Institute. And we bring together um, physical scientists, natural scientists, and social scientists in, in an equal partnership uh, to try and address some of these, of these problems. So uh, we focused our, our, our research at YESI in, in three different areas. We're, we're very interested in the environmental consequences of rapid urbanisation, particularly in the global south, and we're also interested in making ecosystems more resilient and the protection of biodiversity. But what I want to focus on today, and in fact what is one of our major research areas, is the sustainable production of food. And you probably think uh, I've already uh, presented a fairly bleak picture for world agriculture. We've got climate change, um, we've got um, uh, rising populations, and yet we've got environmental damage. But actually, agriculture has got even more problems than that. And one of them is that actually we don't eat very much. We're not, well, actually in my case, <laughs> quite a lot in fact, but, but in terms of the diversity of plants that we eat, it's rather uh, limited. And 80% of our, of our food comes from just 12 plants. Uh, so we're in rather a vulnerable position. And in fact, 50% of the world's food production is wheat, maize and rice. And, and so we're really dangerous rel reliant on just a few kinds of plant. And usually only uh, one or two varieties of those plants. So cultivated Asian rice arises to tide, but that's the primary food source for 50% of the world's population. So half the world is dependent on one variety of one food plant for most of its calories. But we know there are 23 wild species of rice. And we also know that, that our varieties of our cultivated rice that we've bred for and selected for, have, we've really reduced its genetic diversity. So it's estimated that the main variety of Asian rice has 10,000 fewer genes than its wild ancestor. So you can imagine we've really reduced its ability to cope with, with climate change or with pest outbreaks. We've, we've lost a lot of key traits. So the first project I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, this evening is, is one of the first projects we got going at, at YESI, and it's a genuinely interdisciplinary project, as you'll, as you'll see. And it's trying to use... Oops, sorry. Go back and try and find the pointer. Well, I was giving a talk at Oxford once, and I, I didn't press the pointer. I pressed the off projector button. It took about 20 minutes to get it going again. It was nothing as popular then. Try not to do that. So this is using the wild ancestors that I mentioned to try and make cultivated rice, our elite lines, more resilient to increasingly unpredictable water availability. It's supported by the BBSRC, but also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is uh, the wild ancestor, Arriva, Arisa Rufi Pogon, and you'll see enormous roots, lots and lots of leaves. It's more like a triffid than rice, and a very small amount of grain. And of course, it's... <laughs> pretty useless as a food crop because of that. This is a much more sensible structure if we want to actually eat it. Uh, but what we can do is, see, is transfer some of the genes from this wild relative into our elite cultivars. And we can do that by conventional breeding. This is not a GM project. It's about, in this system, we can do this con uh, by ordinary crosses. At least we can if we're Susan McCooch, one of the world's best uh, plant geneticists, rice geneticists at the University of Cornell. And she's produced uh, what we call chromosome uh, segment substituted lines. So these are all the different lines of, of, of our elite cultivar that have got little bits of the genome of Rufi Pogon transferred into them all over the place on their different chromosomes. These are different chromosomes across here. And the lines have got different chunks in. And the hope is that those chunks code for something useful. So in this case, something, a trait like longer roots, which will help them be more resilient to drought. And then we can trial those with our collaborators in India. Here are some of our lines planted out at the Central uh, Rice Research Institute in India, northeast India, seeing if they're actually more resilient in the field. What we've been doing in York is testing responses to drought 
in the lab, growing our, our rice in a, in a greenhouse and subjecting them to, to stress, osmotic stress, and identifying uh, the traits that are associated with improved resilience. And here, this is, uh, this is line four, and it, this increases its root weight when it's stressed uh, osmotically. So that's a sort of equivalent of drought stress. So that's the kind of plant we're after, one that uh, is able to respond to a reduction in, in, in water supply through osmotic stress by increasing its root length. And then what we can do is see how uh, those lines perform in the field. So uh, here are our lines all growing out in the field under different stresses. Here is our kind of wild type. Now some of the lines you'll notice do worse than if we hadn't bothered. Uh, that's the nature of, of research and we're just crossing uh, segments in sort of randomly. So unsurprisingly some of them don't actually do any good. They make things worse. But some of them do really well. And what we want to do is see which bits of genome have been inserted into the lines that do really well, and then we can develop markers for those uh, useful bits of genome and cross them into our new varieties of rice, which can then be grown in the field, hopefully more as, as, as an improved variety that maintains its yield under drought, but is more resilient to drought. That's the goal. But that's a, col a, col a collaboration between plant geneticists, plant biochemists, uh, and plant physiologists. But we're also collaborating with climate modelers, because what we want to know is where in India will these varieties be the most useful. So in India, uh, about 18% uh, of the rice growing area is prone to drought. And about half the rice crop, just less than half the rice crop, is rain-fed. In other words, there's no irrigation. Farmers rely totally on rain to keep their crop irrigated. Now, climate change is starting to impact on the monsoon. And the time that the monsoon arrives, the time it ends, and the amount of, of, of rain that falls, but also these phenomena known as a break day. So what happens with uh, rain-fed mon monsoon rice is that the start of the monsoon, the farmers plant, and the rice needs to receive rain every day. And usually that happens in the monsoon, and then the monsoon finishes and the harvest is, is ready. But what's been happening increasingly is more and more of these break days. So that's when there's a day, some days when there's no rain or very little rain. And we've, uh, with our crop models, we've demonstrated that each additional break day can reduce yield by nine kilos a hectare. So this is a dangerous situation if you're a subsistence farmer and this is you're trying to feed your family growing crops like this. So that's not too good. Uh, and then just to really cheer everyone up, we tried to predict what would happen in the future uh, in 2050. Using the IPCC's climate models, we looked at the areas currently growing rain-fed rice and we looked at areas in 2050 what uh, the predictions would be for the likely success of rain-fed rice growing. And in about half the areas currently dependent on this type of agriculture, we predict that the crop would not be able to be grown because of the changes in the rainfall pattern. So that means we really do need to get on with this and uh, come up with some of these new rice varieties, uh, PDQ. The other thing we need to do is work with farmers to understand what their issues are and what crops traits they need. So this programme involves a big social science component with two Indian PhD students, uh, some Indian scientists and some UK social scientists. And we're looking to find out what traits the farmers are interested in. And in our recent uh, field trip, we went to India and we... Uh, went to some of the villages where, where some of these test uh, varieties have been grown, and we spoke to the farmers. And it was a, a very interesting experience. Uh, mostly we got lots of input from the male members of the community. They were only too pleased to tell us what they wanted. They wanted more pest resistance, more pathogen resistance, nicer grain, etc., etc., a whole list of traits. And in the end, one of the Indian PhD students said to me, you must ask the women what they want. And I was the only woman member of the team, so apparently in, in that, uh, this is in remote parts of, of northeast India, 
women ask women questions, not, not men. So, so I asked uh, a question. I said to the women, what would you like? What do you want to see? Well, I think that's what I said. I mean, I had to be tra translated into Hindi and then into their, their native language and then all the way back again. But I think we got the message across. What would you like? And they said to me, well, what we like is a crop that is no more work to harvest because we have to do every damn thing around here and we don't want any more work. So it was a lesson straight away in the importance of how farming actually works in real communities. We can have the best crops in the world, but if it's more work for already overpressed women farmers, then it's not going to take off. And as I said, we do need to, to crack on with this. These are some rather cheery predictions from the IPCC about uh, the impact of water stress in 2025. These are the areas of the world they predict to suffer from the greatest water stress. You'll see northeast India is right up there. Uh, this is the FAO's uh, cheery prediction on uh, the impact on crop yields with a three degree rise in world temperature. Now, you remember we're trying to, under the new current climate change agreements, we're trying to keep the, the temperature rise down to two degrees. That's taken a little bit of a hit with America threatening to pull out post-Trump. But anyway, there we go. Uh, so three degrees would be pretty catastrophic for uh, Indian crop yields, and you can see there's not much justice in the world. The areas of the world that suffer most from increased uh, climate change impacts are not the areas principally causing the problem. And uh, you can uh, take a look at current trends. Well, you know, this is all looking very much into the future, 2025, 2050. You think, well, will we still all be here by then? Uh, but... Uh, this is current impacts. I've just taken a piece of data from 2015, but you can take it from 2017. You can look at any kind of... This, this appears updated on a monthly basis, so you can entertain yourself for hours looking at the change in rainfall compared to the long-term average. So that's the 84 to, 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 to present long-term average. And you can see the same areas are very much uh, suffering from uh, a decreased rainfall compared to the long-term average. So that's one problem we've got. This um, unpredictable rainfall, uh, increasing droughts in some areas of the world, but of course in the UK, a very much uh, in, uh, drought deluge. If you talk to UK farmers, they say their biggest issue is this huge, huge variation. One minute it's too dry to get your potatoes in, next, next year it's too wet to get your potato picker onto the fields. So this huge variability is another really important problem. But I want to just leave the climatic issues aside for a moment and think about another uh, vulnerability we have in world agriculture, and that is our reliance on pesticides. And uh, current, our current crop protection uh, prevents the loss of around 22 to 40% uh, of food production. And if we take three of our big crops, rice, wheat and potatoes, without any pest control, and remember this is the case, for large numbers of farmers in the global south, they do not have access to any kind of pest control. And they will lose three quarters of their rice and potato crops and half their wheat crop. Even with our best efforts, mechanical and uh, chemical control measures, we're still losing uh, you know, 30 to 40 percent of our, of our crops. But this situation, bad as it is, isn't even sustainable because we're not bringing new pesticides to market. The ones we have are being banned. And uh, I know uh, some people would like to blame EU red tape, but that's, that's not the case. These chemicals are dangerous and damaging. So they have to be removed. But we also have to keep trying to tackle this pest problem. If we can decrease losses to pests, we can feed 25 million more people. So it's not insignificant. But what we've done is reduce... Our, the ability of our crops to fight back. We grow vast monocultures of exactly the same sort of crop uh, over and over again, and we've changed the way our crops look. So any guesses for what this, these are? You've probably, eat, you've probably eaten them today. Potatoes, I hear from back there, yes, potatoes. Those are what potatoes should look like. Wild potatoes look like that. Sainsbury's potatoes look like that. Now, you may well think this looks a lot more appetising. Well, 
Amazingly, so do pests and pathogens. So these are much more vulnerable to uh, diseases like potato cyst nematode, which is a huge problem. That's the biggest cost for UK potato farmers is controlling for potato cyst nematode, and they currently use compounds that will be banned in the future. So that is an issue. And what we've done is bred out the chemicals that make um, these, chem these colours are due to, to, to toxic chemicals in the, in, the, in the potatoes, and we've bred those out because we don't like the taste, and we've got that. So we've made up the difference by chemical control methods. But as I said, that isn't the best way forward. But there is a solution. You're probably thinking, thank goodness, are we going to get some good news in this talk? Um, most of our key crops are grasses. We've changed them dramatically. So this is uh, uh, what the maize that we eat now and, and wild maize. So we've been tinkering away, and this is uh, the, the uh, evolution of wheat, which is now something of a trifid with three sets of chromosomes. Uh, but we, have, we do actually eat grass, and grass has a secret weapon, uh, and that's silicon. And you might think, well, silicon, what's that? Basically, silicon is a very abundant element in soil. It's, it's uh, quartz, uh, well, silica is quartz, silicon oxide. So it's around in sandy soils in particular. There's a lot of it. And plants contain... Oh, sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button. Plants contain up to 10% dry weight silicon, so it's a huge accumulation. So rice accumulates a lot of silicon, more silicon than nitrogen or phosphorus or any of these other elements. So why would they be hyperaccumulators? Well, one idea is that the silicon is taken up in a soluble form and then deposited as silica uh, in, in structures like known as phytoliths or as spines on the leaf surface. So you might think this doesn't look terribly tasty, but what about crop pests? Well, they don't think that's terribly tasty either. So one of the early experiments we did a long time ago now, 10 years ago in fact, um, was to feed some common uh, uh, pests, agricultural pests, this is armyworm and locusts, on plants that were either in uh, low silica in the black bars or, or high silica in white bars, and look at how much they ate. And we did this for six different uh, grass species, and you can see that in every case, the consumption was a lot, uh, was a lot lower. They don't like eating, eating this uh, uh, plant high in silicon. One thing we did find, that uh, this is another agricultural pest, the grain aphid. Um, aphids are particularly problematic for crops because they often carry diseases, viruses, for, for example, um, that, that affect plants. Now, aphids didn't seem quite so bothered uh, about silicon. And we discovered why, uh, but not until 10 years later. That's another thing about research. It takes you ages to find things out, which is a bit of a shame because we, we need to find things out quite quickly. Still, the other thing we demonstrated was um, why exactly silicon had such a bad effect. So just to keep you on your toes, this time the high silicon plants are the dark bars. And we looked at the growth rate of armyworms on plants high in silicon and low in silicon. We found that the silicon reduced the growth rate and it reduced the nitrogen uh, that, the, that the insect could absorb from its food. So this seems to be some sort of mechanism. If you're eating a plant high in silicon, you cannot extract as much nutrition from that food. That slows your growth rate, and it means that you're not particularly keen to eat it. So what's going on here? Why does that happen? Well, the good thing about working with insect pests is that nobody minds if you chuck their heads off <laughs> So uh, people object a bit more if you do that with cuddly creatures, but nobody cares about armyworms. So we could, we could chop their heads off and look at the jaws of, uh, of the mandibles of the insects under the microscope. And this is the, the, the jaws from the, the mandibles from the uh, uh, insect feeding on, on low silicon. And you can see these kind of grooves. These are the kind of teeth, if you like. And the, 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 the insects kind of cut their way through the grass, which is very tough, like this. Uh, but when they've been feeding on silicon, even just for a few, uh, uh, a couple of days, you can see they wear their teeth down. So we looked at uh, whether the um, high silica plants have more impact on mandible wear than the low silica plants, and they do. So it seems as if this mechanism is that it, it wears down the mandibles of the insect. They then can't chew the food as, as well, so they don't, you know, it's like your mum says, chew your food properly. You don't, you don't get as much nutrition out of, of the, the grass. 
And the reason is that, that um, these, uh, the, the silicon particles are really quite abrasive. So it's a little bit like, you know, when you used to go to the beach as a kid and you got sand in your sandwiches. Utterly grim, isn't it? And it's that kind of thing that, that, that is happening here. So it deters feeding, reduces nitrogen absorption and growth, uh, and probably because it's abrasive. So what we did here was, uh, this is a really good example of interdisciplinary research. We uh, grew plants on high and, and low silica again, and then we took the, the grasses and we... Um, we collaborated with people at the University of Manchester who work on, on the wear on women's clothing. Uh, so not an immediately obvious collaboration, but what we could do was they, they have a machine that kind of rubs uh, textiles to see how quickly they wear out. As, uh, um, but what we used it for was to put grass on a Perspex plate and then use the machine to rub a groove. And the more abrasive it is, then the deeper the groove. And then we nipped across the road to the, to the dental school, told you this was innovative collaboration, and they used their laser to measure the depth of the groove in the, in the, uh, in the Perspex. And that told you that, that plants high in silica are more abrasive. But it didn't turn out to be quite as straightforward as that, because what we, uh, what we found was that generally there was a good relationship between the silica concentration in plants along the this axis and its abrasiveness in terms of the depth of the grooves that could cut on the plates. But there were some plants that differed uh, a lot in abrasion, but not very much in silica concentration. So for Stuca rubra, that's FR, and for Stuca rovina, closely related plants are in the same genus, uh, uh, and they have similar, uh, not identical, but similar uh, silicon concentrations, but wildly different abilities to impact on abrasion. So we wanted to know why that was. The other thing uh, we wanted to know about was uh, another phenomenon that we discovered about silicon, and that is that plants take up more silicon when they're damaged. So um, this was an experiment we did with, some, uh, with locusts again, with scissors, and with some much cuter herbivores, voles. We didn't chop their heads off, I hasten to add. Um, and the first thing we noticed was that if we damaged the plants just once by all these methods, there was no increase in silicon concentration in the plant tissue. The plants didn't really take any notice. When we damaged repeatedly then we saw an increase in the mechanical damage of the scissors, in the locusts, and with the vole damage. But you'll notice another thing. Uh, there was much bigger response when real animals damaged the plant compared to scissors. And we think that this is because, well, we know it's because the, the, the herbivores can detect, uh, the plants can detect signals in, in herbivore saliva. So they know it's a real, a real herbivore. So they, most, they, they upregulate their defences. They make, get their defences ready uh, more when there's, a real, when there's a real herbivore, and more when there's repeated damage. But again, it didn't turn out to be quite as simple as that. And when we looked at uh, different genotypes of plants, we saw something different. So this is a plant called Avenella, and this is a plant called Deschampsia. Now, Deschampsia responds to damage usually with a big increase. So all these genotypes... Uh, so on your side, it's that side, that's the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, it's the damaged plants, and you can see there's generally an increase. But sometimes we've got genotypes where there didn't seem to be much of an increase. And Avenella generally didn't respond to damage, but sometimes it did. So there were differences uh, between species and within species in terms of these silicon defences. So we needed to know more about how silicon gets into the plant and how it's deposited and what it does. Um, now, that isn't well known, actually, uh, at least not as well known as it should be. What we do know comes mostly from rice, and that suggests that um, the uh, silicon comes into the roots through uh, an aquaporin-type passive transporter that just sucks up water, called LSI1. It then crosses the root system... Uh, and it requires an active proton pump, an energy-demanding process, uh, governed by a transporter called LSI2. It somehow then gets uploaded into the xylem. We're not very sure then it, exactly how that happens. And it travels up the plant, and then it's taken out of the xylem by a transporter called LSI6. And then somehow or other, 
also not really known, but probably involving uh, a recently discovered transporter called LSI-3. I don't quite know what's happened to LSI-4 or 5. They seem to have been forgotten about. But, and then it gets deposited in, in the leaf surface and in these phytoliths. So the process is quite complex, and how plants look in terms of their silicon depends a lot on the, how these transporters work. And you can see some plant surfaces look like that under the microscope, and some look like that. So you can imagine that there could be big differences in the palatability of those plants to herbivores. So we set up a project to, uh, to look at how um, plants actually uh, deposited silicon. And we had three different plant species, the two fastiquas I've mentioned before, and Deschampsia. And we just did nothing to the plants. We damaged them. We added silicon, or we did both. And then we looked, using an X-ray method, where the uh, silicon was deposited and how much there was. <coughs> OK, so here are the plant surfaces uh, when there's no silicon and no damage. And this is the Deschampsia and Festuca rubra and Festuca ravina. The yellow colour is silicon deposition. So you can see instantly there are huge differences in how the silicon's deposited. Deschampsia has these really evil-looking spines... And um, Festuca rubra just seems to kind of lay the silicon out along the surface with one or two little nobbles. Uh, and Festuca ravina looks like it's got measles. It just has silicon in these nobbles, very restricted to, the knob to these sort of structures. And then when you, when you damage or add silicon, it's pretty similar actually, you see the responses of the plants differ. So Deschampsia uh, increases the amount of deposition on the surface, it increases the number of spines, and it also produces these additional nobbles. For Stuka rubra, it doesn't really do very much. There's a few more nobbles, but not really. And for Stuka ravina, uh, when it's given extra silica, when it's damaged, produces uh, silicon all across the surface, it still keeps its nobbles, and it produces these big, long spines that are full of silicon. So plants respond in different ways to these challenges, and... They, um, they, they produce very different plant surfaces. So you can imagine, if you were an insect trying to tackle this or this, it would be worse than trying to tackle that. And, it, and so it really, we really demonstrated that it's not how much silicon you have, but it's what you do with it. So in actual fact, Festuca ovina and Festuca rubra tend to have fairly similar levels of silicon in the different treatments. If, if anything, Festuca rubra had higher levels. But it, didn't, it wasn't an effective use of silicon. It didn't actually do any good. Uh, and if you look here, this is uh, Festuca ravina with uh, very low silicon content and causing just as much mandible, mandible wear as, much, uh, as plants with much higher levels of silicon. So there's almost 10 times as much silicon in this plant as this plant, but the mandible wear is the same. So in terms of how resistant they are to, to, to pests and insects, it's not how much silicon you, you've got exactly, it's what you do with it. So we sort of came to the conclusion that, uh, that actually quality uh, uh, beat quantity, really, and plants have different strategies for how they use the silicon that they take up. And, we thought that uh, Festuca ravina was rather more effective than Festuca rubra because it can be more abrasive with less silicon by producing these structures. But of course what we need to do now is understand much more about this process and also how we can use it. I've talked about this really in natural grass species which is all very nice but we don't actually eat those. So we've now got a, a project on, oops, sorry, I keep doing that, um, on tall fescue and you might think, well, I don't eat much tall fescue either. Uh, no, you don't, but you, uh, you uh, eat, eat the cattle that do eat tall fescue. It's a forage grass. And it's also a turf grass. And DLF Trifolium are, are one of the world's largest grass breeders. And they were very interested in controlling silicon deposition in their plants. Because they want to have forage grasses that don't have very much silicon, so the cattle don't cut their mouth, you know, mouth to ribbons, but they want turf grasses that have some silicon because they're more resilient to wear when kids are running up and down on it. Well, obviously, you don't want too much silicon or they cut their knees to ribbons, which isn't good. So they wanted to know about silicon deposition in their grass varieties. And they have hundreds of grass varieties. 
And they have a really interesting way of categorising them. They grow them all up in the field or in the greenhouse, and then they walk along and they, they feel the leaves. And they were classifying their, their grasses as harsh, semi-harsh, quite harsh, a little bit harsh, ooh, soft, ooh, very, very soft. Uh, and it's not terribly quantitative, it has to be said. So we thought we could do a little bit better than that. Uh, and so what we got some of these grasses, this is a harsh variety and a soft variety, and we looked at them under the, under the microscope, and uh, we could see far more spines uh, and longer spines and nastier spines in the harsh variety than the soft variety. So definitely that explains why they feel different. Does it explain, uh, is it explained by silicon? Uh, and indeed it is. Uh, my PhD student who produced this graph, yes, she's got a future as an interior designer somehow, but anyway. Um, so very, very soft, very soft, soft, semi-soft, semi-harsh, and harsh. Uh, and you can see this is the amount of silicon uptake uh, corrected for the amount of, uh, of, of root biomass. And you can see that, because uh, the plants are different sizes, you can see there's a very good relationship between how efficient they are at taking up silicon and, and how harsh they feel. So what, uh, what uh, underpins that, of course, these are, this is a grass breeding company. They want to know if they can manipulate the genetic uh, makeup of their, of their uh, grass lines, if they can find markers for these characteristics. So they wanted to know what was happening at the molecular level, so um, Emma, the PhD student, has uh, characterised the activity of the silicon transporters in the root tissue, uh, comparing uh, harsh and very, very soft genotypes, uh, both in undamaged conditions and damaged conditions. It was a huge effort, because um, uh, uh, tall fescue is a very complicated plant, it's, it, 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 it's got multiple genomes, and it, um, it's, it's not... Uh, uh, it's, it's a hexaploid, I think, or, uh, but it can actually vary in its ploidy, and there's no good sequence to compare it against. So it nearly drove her completely insane, and she had to have a high, special high access to high-performance computers to do it all. But in the end, she discovered something quite interesting. And if you look at undamaged plants, the LSI2 transporter is expressed... <coughs> well, the genes for the LSI2 transporter is expressed more in the harsh variety. So, in other words, the reason it feels harsh is that the transporter that, that pumps the, the silicon across the root tissue uh, is more active in the harsh plants. And when you damage them, both the root uh, LSI2 transporter and the transporter that, uh, that, uh, that takes uh, the material out of the xylem is upregulated in the harsh variety. Uh, not in the soft variety. The soft variety increases the expression of the transporter associated with uh, passive intake of silicon, that's the LSI1, but it doesn't seem to do much with it once it's taken more in. So it looks as if it, there is some... Uh, this is very preliminary data, we need to, we need to do this, this more, but there's, um, there's certainly at least an indication that it's differences in these transporters that are driving what's happening uh, in terms of silicon deposition. So let's get back to crops that people actually eat. Uh, and this is uh, silicon uptake in two rice varieties, and they see similar differences. So Nip and Bare uh, takes up more silicon than this other variety, Kalasa. And that is also due to differential expression in the transporters. In this case, LSI1 seemed to be the driving force. And they could then relate that difference to uh, yield in the field. Ooh, that rhymed. Um, and uh, what they did was take wild-type rice and then uh, transgenic rice where the uh, LSI1 transporter had been inact inactivated. It no longer functions. And they looked at shoot silicon uh, uh, concentrations. And you can see when there's no transporter, unsurprisingly, there's no silicon, and that means there's no yield because you get much, much more damage. So this is the wild type, and this is the mutant. So it looks as if there's some sort of relationship between uh, uh, silicon uptake and, well, silicon transporters, silicon uptake and deposition, pest resistance, and yield. But is that true in all our crops? Remember, we were talking about... Uh, <coughs> domestication and the way that we'd uh, changed 
our crops and a study recently looked at 203 different crop varieties and found that the most common trait change during domestication is the loss of these compounds, these toxic compounds that cause colour, flavour and toxicity. No wonder we always claim our food doesn't taste of anything anymore. We've kind of bred it out. So there are two kind of bottlenecks in domestication where we get rid of genetic diversity and the, and the genes that code for these compounds. One is when we take a wild species and do an early domestication. Um, and so these are very ancient land races when we first started the domestication process, and it might be hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. And these are our elite modern cultivars. So we reduce the genetic diversity at each of those stage. So what we were interested in seeing is if we looked at uh, barley, could we see any difference in the early domestications of barley compared to the modern varieties in terms of their silicon defences? And then for a whole range of crops, we compared, compared the wild ancestor, the early domesticates, and the modern varieties. And we looked at changes in silicon defences. Have they been removed? And actually, the good news is they don't seem to have been. This is uh, barley, and just for a bit of uh, variety, silicon's now blue, so it's just as well we don't eat barley leaves, isn't it? Uh, there is the silicon on these spines, and you can see it's uh, all waiting there under, in the cell underneath the spine, and... There it is in the tip of the spine. And this is uh, beer barley, which is a, a land race, no longer, no longer grown, but was, was very popular in, in Scotland at one point. And this is a modern cultivar. And you can see these are very similar responses to silicon addition and, and damage. So it looks quite good. And uh, this is our comparisons against the wild ancestor in the grey, the early domesticates and land races in the green, and the modern cultivars across the whole uh, comparison of different crops, there's rice here, and there's, there's sorghum, and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's maize, there's a number of different crops we tried, uh, millet and, as well. There was no real significant effect. Some of the crops, there did seem to be a little bit of a decrease, that's quite a big decrease actually for that particular one, but other times it seems to have increased again. So there's no consistent pattern. It doesn't look like we've managed to breed out silicon Uptake, And of course the reason for that is that silicon is an important uh, defence in crops and it's important in a number of ways. But another thing it's important for is, is structure. So plants need silicon in their, in their cell walls for, for stiffness and rigidity. So that could be one possible reason why it's proved resistant to, to breeding out. And I just want to move on to pathogens, which I haven't said much, uh, much about, uh, but, but there's been increasing interest in the use of silicon to, to improve disease resistance in crops, which is a lot more serious sometimes than, than pathogens. This is powdery mildew on Arabidopsis, and again, they've used a similar technique to myself to visualise where the silicon is. And um, you can see that this is where the disease is most prevalent, and the silicon deposition is around the areas where the disease is most is, is most uh, uh, active, uh, and this is a plant that hasn't had any silicon uh, access. So it's, uh, they found that silicon was a physical barrier to disease, but they also found that it actually helped upregulate other defensive responses. It somehow stimulated the plant to get going uh, and, and turn on lots of different uh, defences, and this is just uh, a comparison of the gene expression and the two uh, um, with and without silicon to show you the impact that it has on the whole mechanisms of plant defence in, in, uh, in these crops. And uh, I've looked a little bit at this in, in soybean this time, so uh, with, with collaborators in, in Canada. Uh, and stem and root rot is one of the most damaging diseases of, of soybean. It completely destroys the crop. And uh, what we did was grow uh, soybean hydroponically uh, and uh, these plants have had no silicon in the solution they're growing in, and these plants have got silicon in the solution, and uh, then they were exposed to the disease. And you can see when they're growing with silicon in the solution, they were very resistant, or certainly much more resistant than these poor guys. And that seems to be quite a, a general uh, phenomenon. So it isn't just me that bangs on about silicon. Here's a a paper recently uh, towards establishing broad spectrum disease resistance in plants, silicon leads the way. Uh, and uh, here's another one, benefits of plant silicon for crops are reviewed. So there's increasing interest in, in using this 
uh, this technique, because silicon is very abundant in soils, uh, but there are some soils that are deficient in silicon if the plant is... Uh, you, you can imagine, if you're growing rice, rice takes up a lot of silicon, you harvest the rice, you burn the straw, you, you don't return the silicon to the soil. So the Chinese have taken to adding huge chunks of silicon uh, to the soil. So just to summarise where we, where we are with this, silicon is a very effective uh, plant defence, which affects herbivore and pathogen performance. Um, and it's really got a potential to, to harness, uh, we can harness this defence, uh, I think, for, uh, for, for sustainable crop protection. There's a whole uh, conference on silicon in agriculture. Every four years, people get together and say, isn't this uh, a great thing to do? And um, I just want to end very briefly, because I know we've, we're, we're running out of time a little bit, and I want to allow time for questions, um, on uh, actually in, in, uh, why we need to sort of implement this and the ways we can. Um, we've got things like Sustainable Agriculture Research Innovation Club, which I chair. We, we're looking for new technologies to, for, with practical applications. Uh, Jonathan kindly mentioned the NA Agri-Food uh, Consortium across uh, a number of, of universities. And here we're taking very much an interdisciplinary approach, right from soil health, right through to, to, to food waste. So I think we need to address sustainability of agriculture across the whole piece, not just uh, from sort of traditional crop protection and crop genetics, which I know is what I've mostly talked about, but we also need to think about supply chains uh, and, and, and food waste. And so the NA Agri-Food Programme uh, has three different themes. There's something about three themes. Yes, it has three themes. This has three themes. I'm obsessed with, with three themes. Um, sustainable food production is one where we look at soil health and resilient and uh, crop production and, uh, and use uh, novel di diagnostics. We've spent most of the money so far on, on branding. There's our cutesy little... Uh, I'm not sure if that's a pig or a cow, actually. But anyway, there we go. Rather oversized chicken. But uh, the, the one area is looking very much at, at, at crops and livestock in the field and how to improve the, uh, productivity. One is looking at... Uh, theme two is resilient supply chains, looking at the whole issue of how we transport food and how that's going to be impacted. Very interesting times for supply chains, I would have said at the moment. I had... Uh, I had, uh, uh, at our graduation dinner, I sat next to uh, head of logistics at Nestle. He was a little worried, probably even more worried, actually, since the latest set of executive orders from across the Atlantic. But actually, uh, uh, trade is going to be a real issue and regulation around trade. And the third uh, area is very much around, around waste and changes in behaviour and diet and improving consumption and, and health. We can't actually grow our way out of this of this mess. We need to effectively you know, reduce consumption, change consumption, eat less meat, and, and just, well, just eat less, actually, especially in my case. I don't quite know what, my, what picture my desk is doing on this slide, but <laughs> basically we do need to change patterns of, 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 of consumption because this problem isn't getting any uh, better. Um, we've basically got increasing demand for our food, animal feed, and biofuels. We've got decreasing agricultural land availability per capita. So we've got to be innovative. And we've got to think about sustainable intensification, where we increase yields without adverse environmental impacts. We need a second green revolution, which is knowledge intensive, not input intensive. Now, there isn't, despite what might seem to be a bit of a gloomy uh, run through agricultural problems, there isn't any need to despair, I don't think. We've been changing agriculture for centuries, uh, millennia. So we can, we can do this. We can innovate in agriculture. It's what we've always done. And maybe the farms of the future are going to look a bit like this. Um, so we've just got to be really creative and look at different solutions. And I'm going to leave the, the last word to Darwin. It's, uh, it, who better? It's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent but the one most responsive to change. I think we can be responsive to change. I think the way forward, though, is interdisciplinary approaches and innovation, and that's the way to solve uh, these issues. So thank you very much. <laughs>